Now, a very warm welcome to all who have joined us tonight. And I must, must say that I'm certainly privileged to be able to be with you again. Um, I, I, I actually looked at my records and it was just a little over a year back in June of 2020 that I was able to be with you. It's hard to believe that it's been a year. Um, but since that time, of course, we have, we have moved. Um, again, you know, Bill actually mentioned we're a new resident to the Maritimes. I'm not quite sure that that's, that's accurate. Um, we're in Atlantic Canada, uh, but we're not exactly new. We, we, we have returned and uh, we're certainly very glad to be back on the rock. And uh, we have appreciated what has been done and what, is, what, what the Lord is doing here. Some of you will be very much aware of the, of the very sad and sudden home call of our brother Sandy Felton um, on the 31st of May uh, and the very unexpected uh, drowning that took place. It's, it's left a huge hole in a lot of our hearts and um, has certainly impacted the work. And so uh, I know your prayers for Marilyn, his wife and family and the little assembly there in Sandringham would be really deeply appreciated. Uh, every every believer is so vital, isn't it? And um, we, we just we just feel the loss of our brother Sandy. He was he was a, a, real, a true Christian, and um, a, a very very dear friend of ours. Uh, I had spoken to him on Sunday afternoon. Uh, we were still in quarantine at that point, and so uh, we are looking forward to spending some time together again, as we have over the years. And uh, before Monday night came, Sandy Feltham had gone home to heaven. So it's, it's, a sad, it's a sad loss. And yet the work of God continues. I'd like to look at a number of scriptures tonight. And so uh, I just encourage you to get your Bibles on. I, I know Zoom meetings are very comfortable in the fact that you can just sit back with your coffee and you can just kind of listen to the speaker. Um, well, that's all right. Uh, I'm not being critical. but. Uh, I do want to look at some of the scriptures because what I would like to do tonight is very simply look at finding ourselves in the scriptures. If, if someone were to look at your life as a believer uh, in a local assembly, and I realize that there's, a, there's quite a wide variety of assemblies that have joined us online tonight, um, if they would be able to give one word to describe you or describe me, I wonder what would they say? Well, I think there's, there's certainly a lot of believers in the, in the New Testament scriptures, so the book of the Acts, and then on in the, into the epistles, and of course the Gospels as well, that, that are outstanding. Sometimes they're only mentioned once, and yet there are features of them that are certainly noteworthy. And so I just want to look briefly, uh, because there's a variety of, of, of uh, references here, but um, so just really finding yourselves in the, in the scripture. Uh, spiritual descriptions of, of believers in New Testament times. Now, I just want to read in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32. It's a very interesting account here. Uh, it's actually a song that Moses is, is giving at the end of his days. He's about to leave, and um, he, he is speaking to the nation. And so in Deuteronomy, chapter 32, and we'll look at verse number nine, it says, For the Lord's portion, is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye, and so on. A very wonderful description of the, of the Lord's dealings with his own people, Israel. But what strikes me in, in that, actually in verse 9, it says, for the Lord's portion is his people. And then it says, Jacob, Jacob of all people, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Now, we're well aware that Jacob was, uh, was a pretty crooked man. Um, he was a deceiver. He was a cheat. Um, I'm not sure you'd want to have him as a close friend of yours. But it says, Jacob is, is the lot of the Lord's inheritance. And that to me is, is both thrilling and astounding because the Lord was well aware of what he was getting when he, when he took up dealings with, with this, this man called Jacob. But 
as we follow the, the course of Jacob's life, we understand that the, the last picture we get, if we had an iPhone, we could take the last picture and we'd see an old man leaning on the top of his staff. And what is he doing? He's worshiping. Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph, and he worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. And that to me is, is, a, is a very, very wonderful picture of a man whom God took up sovereign dealings with, molded him, disciplined him, uh, certainly uh, had many, many uh, singular dealings with this man. Uh, there were ups and there were downs, and there were mountaintops and there were valleys. But uh, ultimately, this man came to the end of his journey as a worshiper. That would be a wonderful, a wonderful feature of every single one of us if we could end our, our pilgrimage here as worshipers. You remember being in a, in a bedroom in Calgary and they had a little text on the wall and it, it just went like this, that the Lord loves me or God loves me the way I am and too much to leave me like that. And I think that's true, isn't it? That the Lord loves us the way we are. Uh, he has saved us as sinners, well aware of who we are, well aware of our past, well aware of our future. But his love is, is so, so personal and so far-reaching that he deals with us, molding us into the image of his beloved son. And um, that, is, that is wonderful truth. But I think as, as we look at the assemblies that we're a part of, and then as we look at the scriptures, we, we understand that God does love people. The, the purposes of God and the work of God involves people. Uh, I think we understand that God loves variety. Uh, he, he didn't make us all the same. And every individual has value in his sight. But I'm well aware and you're well aware that um, uh, th th there are difficulties with dealing with each one of us with people. Uh, some of us are not very user friendly. And uh, I don't know if my brother Robert McElwain is listening tonight, but uh, I, I've enjoyed working with him. But I, I, I do remember a statement he made, and you've likely heard it as well, when he says, I, I don't know how the Lord puts up with us. And uh, I think that's, that's true. I don't know how the Lord puts up with me, but he does. And so the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. So let's just go to Acts chapter 9. I'm just going to uh, read a very familiar portion, Acts chapter 9. I'll just read part of it because this is well-known truth for many. Verse number 10 of Acts chapter 9. It says, and there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street called Straight, and, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints in Jerusalem, and here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. There's further descriptions of Ananias and, and the Lord's dealings with him, but um, I just want to start with Ananias because here's a man, and if I could just put one little, one little word alongside of this man, I, I would just say that this was a man who was known as the available, the available. His name is only mentioned once in the Bible, Acts chapter 9, and he, he fades from view. And yet this, this was a pivotal moment, wasn't it? This was a turning point in, in God's dealings with, with a chosen vessel by the name of Saul of Tarsus. And uh, as part of God's dealings with Saul of Tarsus, he used a man by the name of Ananias to make that first connection. What stands out in my mind is, is simply this, that here was a man who was available for God's service. He was available for God's service. 
Now, this was not an easy assignment. Uh, I, I think sometimes we just think it's uh, we just um, no problem at all. But uh, I, I have thought that uh, if the Lord called me to speak to Osama bin Laden when he was still living, to to have have some personal spiritual dealings with him, I I think I'd be just like Ananias as the Lord. This this is not easy. This is an arch enemy. And uh, that's exactly what, what Ananias mentioned to the Lord. But when the Lord called him, he says, behold, here I am. I'm available. And I think the big question tonight is simply this. When the Lord calls our name, what's our response? Because the Lord still calls us. The Lord still has work for us. The Lord's, the, the Spirit of God still touches our hearts with regard to worship and so on, and service and fellowship and, 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 uh, and uh, seeking to meet the needs of, of fellow believers. And, and sometimes I'm afraid when he calls our name, we are unavailable, too busy, too occupied with other things. But here's a man, he was available for God's service. He was also appreciative of God's dealings. Uh, we didn't read it, but when you read down the, the, the passage, his first words to this man who had just been saved were words of amazing grace. Brother Saul, brother Saul. Never met the man before. Was well aware of who he was in his past. And the, the, the very, very disastrous uh, purpose of his coming to Damascus. But he appreciated this man, Ananias, appreciated the dealings of God in this man's life. And we're, we're not exactly told all that he, he mentioned to him, but Ananias must have been able to convey God's truth to this man because Saul desired to be baptized. And I'm sure that Ananias poured in the, the, the word of God and the grace of God into this man's life who had just experienced the life of uh, of, of, of salvation for the, not just for the rest of his days, but for all eternity. Available, the available. I well remember listening to a brother, David Jones, who's now home in heaven, but David, of course, spent many, many years in, in the work in Chile. And uh, as part of that work, as you very likely know, he had a, a radio broadcast, a daily radio broadcast, that went on for many, many years. One time he had gone to the radio station to, uh, to actually do the recording, to present the recording, and uh, the, a, actually a technician came up to him and said, David, we're wondering if you could do us a little favor. Uh, we are making a, a recording of a, of a symphony orchestra, and uh, the, recording, um, uh, the, the recording technician is, is unable to be there, so we're wondering, would, would you fill in? Would you be available? And, uh, and, and David Jones says, I, I'd, be, I'd be delighted. And so they put David Jones right in the middle of the orchestra, a, a live orchestra. And he said it was, it was amazing. It was astounding. He said, because when that conductor raised his baton, all those musicians were focused on the conductor. And as the music started, they, every part of that symphony orchestra responded to the conductor's baton. The strings came in and they, they were quieted. And, and then the woodwinds came in and then the brass played their part and the percussion uh, hit the drum at the right point and everything moved in response to the conductor. And he said, it, I just couldn't help but think of, of, the, of the Spirit's work in our lives individually and collectively. And I just, he said, I, I, I've often wondered how responsive are we to our conductor's gestures? Um, Sunday morning, when the Spirit of God touches your soul and says, now it's your turn to, to pray. It's your turn to worship. I'm not just talking about brethren, I'm talking about sisters as well. Sisters silently, brethren audibly. Does the music continue? Or does the music stop? I think sometimes we, we are just unavailable. We, we, we just 
were just not responsive. And yet in Acts chapter 9, we have this one man. The only time it's mentioned, he's mentioned. And yet he was available to be a part of the dealings of God. Let's go back to Acts chapter 4. Just a couple of pages back, Acts chapter 4. I have to watch that clock because it's going quickly already. Acts chapter 4. And um, verse number 36. This is, and Joseph, or Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the, the son of consolation, or the son of exhortation, or we might say the son of encouragement, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Let's just go back to chapter 9, because there's another reference to, to um, Barnabas. Verse number 26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed or he attempted to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord on the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. Ananias is known as the available, but I think if we were to put a, uh, a title on this man, Barnabas, I, I think we'd be able to just say, well, he's the encourager. He's the encourager. And what a tremendous need it is with regard to encouragement in these, in these very difficult days. Um, this was one of, the, one of the individuals in the Bible who had his name changed. His name was Joseph or Joseph. And, um, but as the apostles got to know him, and as they saw his, his character and appreciated his personality and just watched his, his response to the, to the work of God that was, was, uh, was booming at that time, they said to Joseph, they said, we've got to change your name. You are such an encouragement. We're going to call you Barnabas, Barnabas. And you know, it's wonderful when an assembly has a Barnabas in it, or has a Barnabet uh, with sisters in it as well. And thank God there, there are those that are encouragers, because it's a vital need in, in our lives personally, and a vital need in our lives collectively. I think there are some very obvious things about this man that, uh, that we can just notice. Uh, Acts chapter 4 tells us that he was a liberal man, a liberal man. He had a piece of a land, he had a, he had a field, he sold it uh, under no compulsion, and he brought the, the proceeds just to help the work of God. He was a liberal man. A and thank God there, there are many, many liberal Christians who give of their substance. And uh, that's, a, that's a great encouragement. It, it's a great part of the, of the work of God. But, you know, sometimes, as one man described, he said, sometimes Christians are believers from the, from the waist up. Um, when it hits their pocketbook, somehow things change and, and they just, uh, they're just unwilling to, to really part with, with, their, with their money and with their possessions. Well, that's not Barnabas. Barnabas was a man who was liberal, who freely invested with an interest in the, in the work of God. But he was also large-hearted, large-hearted. He, again, like Ananias, he appreciated what God had done. He appreciated the grace of God that had worked such a, such a miracle in changing this, this arch enemy of the gospel and the arch enemy of Christ and arch enemy of the believers. And uh, his, his perspective was not narrow. He allowed the grace of God to, to, to thrill his soul and, and to activate his, his interest. And when Saul tried to join himself to the disciples, and you can just sense that there was a, there was a concrete wall holding him back. We, we don't trust this man. It was Barnabas that went out because of the large-hearted perspective that marked him. And in doing so, he, he became a link, a link between believers. That's what an encourager does. He becomes a link between believers. And sometimes there are believers and they're going through hard times. Sometimes they're very discouraged. 
And yet here comes the Barnabases, here comes the Barnabet, and they draw alongside and they, they provide a link back to the assembly and a link back to Christian fellowship and a link back to the enjoyment of Christ. And as you follow the, the course of, of Barnabas in the New Testament, yes, there was, a, there was a sad chapter when he and Paul didn't work anymore together. But I think the other side of it is that here was a man who, who labored for the restoration of a believer, his nephew, John Mark, that somehow had, had maybe deviated from the pathway. You see, he was, a, he was an encourager. And I think that we all appreciate the fact that one of the, one of the needs of 2021, especially with COVID still, still, still uh, affecting so many of our lives and so many assemblies, there's a tremendous need for an encourager in our midst. Some of you have likely heard the story, but I, I like the, 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 I think it's a true story of a, of a little newspaper boy who was standing on the, the windy streets of Chicago. It was winter time, and it was bitterly cold. The day was far spent, night was coming on, and this little newspaper boy standing on one of the windy corners trying to, trying to eke out a living. He, he was very poor, it was obvious from his clothes. He wasn't very warmly dressed, he was just trying to sell the, the rest of his papers before heading to his, his home, wherever that was but uh, there weren't very, very many people there. And uh, it, it didn't look very good until just as darkness was coming on, there was a businessman that had left the office, was heading home. And uh, as he was making his way as quick as he could because it was a cold, windy night, he just happened to notice this little newspaper boy standing there, shivering with a pile of newspapers and the street really empty around him. And there was something that told him, you got to do something for this little boy. And so he, he went, to the, went up to the little, little newspaper fellow and he said, uh, you got some newspapers for sale? Yes, sir. He says, I'll, I'll take them all. Take them all? The little newspaper boy could hardly believe is like, take them all? Yes, he said, I'll take them all. And uh, took out his wallet, paid him a, paid him a, the, the, the amount and maybe likely a little bit more. And just as he was about to leave, he said to the little boy, he says, it's a, it's a cold night, isn't it, son? And the little boy said, you know, it's a lot warmer since you came by. So you know, I, I've often thought that there are believers and it becomes a lot warmer when they come by. They lift up our spirits. They encourage us. They put new strength into our into our bones, you might say, because they're, they're there to lift up uh, despondent spirits. You know, sometimes the work of God has what I have called head swellers, and um, that's not encouragement. That's, uh, that, that just kind of false praise, head swellers. And then, of course, there's the other extreme. We have some head swatters, we want to try and keep people down, and we don't want them to get a big head. But I think what we desperately need in our day are some heart encouragers. And I think there's just two very simple questions as I, as I just pause here very quickly with regard to encouragement. Number one, whom? Whom can I encourage? I wonder, did, did, you, did you encourage anyone today? Was there anyone that came across your pathway that you sought to encourage? Whom can I encourage? But a second question is simply this. How can I do it most effectively? How can I do it most effectively? And I think that there is certainly a, a variety of, of answers for that. Sometimes it might be a phone call. Sometimes it might be a text. Sometimes it might be a coffee together. Whatever the case. We are in desperate need of, of encouragers, those that will lift up uh, hands that hang down and uh, knees that are feeble and put new strength in our bones to be able to go on for God. Well, Barnabas was the encourager, but uh, there's another, another segment of believers. And so let's go to Romans chapter 16. Just a few pages over, Romans chapter 16. <clears throat> 
And you'll notice that this is a, a chapter of, of many names. There's actually, I think, 26 names in Romans chapter 16. But we'll look at verse number one. I commend unto, the, unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centuria, that ye receive her in the Lord as become a saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succorer of many, and of myself also. Then he says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church which is in their house, and so on. Just drop down to verse number nine. Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ, and Stachdes, my beloved. And again, drop, drop down to verse number 21. Timotheus, or Timothy, my work fellow, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sosiper, my kinsmen, salute you. 26 names mentioned in this chapter, and you know, there's not one negative statement made about any of them. I'm sure there were flaws and blemishes, but here's Paul, and he's looking at these various individuals and uh, he just appreciates that there are individuals, there are fellow believers, and they are known as the helpers, the helpers. I wonder, uh, where are, are, are we known as the helpers? Uh, Priscilla and Aquila, Urbane, Urbane, Timothy, and later on in the, in the epistles, there's Timothy and so on. Philemon, who was a fellow laborer. Titus was a fellow helper. I think it's obvious that, that Paul was not a, a lone wolf. He, he wasn't a, a worker that just resided by himself. He surrounded himself with an awful lot of individuals, brethren and sisters, who were the, the helpers in the work. And as he writes, his letters recognize these individuals, and um, he appreciates the time, their devotion, their energy, and their substance that they put into the work. You know, I think when we look at an assembly, the helpers are the very backbone, the very backbone of the work. So what, what constitutes a helper? Uh, if you have any helpers in Charlottetown or the various assemblies that are, are part of the Zoom tonight, uh, how would you describe a, a helper? Well, I think, first of all, a helper is an individual who is willing, willing to participate. They, they volunteer at times, and if they are free, they pitch in. And uh, I, can, I can tell you from experience that if they're not free, sometimes they will actually rearrange their schedule. Now, I, I couldn't help but think of my dear brother, George Way, who is now home in heaven. But I remember George was saved in 1985. John Procopio and myself were having meetings in Gander, and uh, it was just a, a real thrill to see the dealings of God with George. And uh, a moment came when he trusted Christ and everything changed for dear George. But George, among other things, was known as a, as a helper. And, and I will re well remember, uh, likely about a year later, we are working on the on the game. You just lost your sound, Marvin. Did you mute yourself? Okay. Yeah, you're okay now. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Uh, did you get about George Wade? Did you hear about George? Yeah, it's just the last minute or so there, just the last 30 seconds maybe. Okay. Uh, George was saved in 1985, and uh, by 1986, we were still working on the Gander Hall. And uh, work had kind of slowed to a crawl. You, you know how it is when, when projects kind of start, start quickly and with a lot of enthusiasm, and as the months go by, uh, things kind of start to slow down. And by 1986, um, some of us were working by ourselves. I remember one day he asked me, he said, Marv, what are, what are you doing up at the hall? I, I see you're, you're 
your van there? Well, I said, well, I'm trying to put some gyprock up around the, the heating ducts. Well, he said, what time do you start? I says, well, usually in the morning. Well, he says, look, he says, I've got to go to work at eight. But he said, I'm willing to come at 6.30 and help you for an hour and a half. I said, really? He says, really? I said, if you're, if you're willing, I'm willing. And so from 6.30 on, morning after morning, George was there before going off to the office to work. You, you see, here was a man who was, was willing to participate. And uh, the second thing about a, about a helper is that they don't wait to be told what to do. They, they, they don't wait to be asked. They see a need and then they respond to, to, to just, just however they are able to contribute. You know, a, a helper has no desire for prominence. They don't advertise themselves. They're not trying to make headlines. They don't make sure that everybody else knows what they're doing. And of course that's sort of You muted again, Mervyn. Sorry. I'm not touching anything. You're back again. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> Just tell me when I'm when I'm offline. Helpers have discovered the truth of the body is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That the body has many parts, and every part is so vital. You know, I think in an assembly, sometimes as it's been described like a professional football game, on the field are 22 men in desperate need of rest. And up on the stands, there's likely 50 or 60,000 spectators in desperate need of exercise. And sometimes a local church and assembly is just like that. There's just a few down on the field that are trying to grind up the yards, trying to move the work ahead. And on the, in, in, in the grandstands, there are the vast majority of believers and they're just kind of watching and adjudicating and uh, criticizing, why don't they do this? And why haven't they done that? And, and so on. But you know, when a, when, a, when, a, when a believer understands the truth of the body, they will appreciate and they will understand that every part of the body is vital. And even though I'm not an eye, I have something to contribute. And brethren and sisters, you do as well. You're, 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 you're not someone that is not required, not needed. Every aspect and every individual in the assembly has a tremendous function to carry out. And so I think we might, might just ask ourselves, will, will we be remembered as, as a helper? Will we be missed when we go? I think I can honestly say that Sandy Feltham is, is already missed because he's no longer with us. Will our impact be felt when we leave or will it just carry on without missing a beat? Sometimes, you know, we, we don't realize how extensive a ministry really is until the, the believer, the brother or the sister is actually gone. Um, so vital to be, to be a helper. And I trust that we understand that when it comes to spiritual gifts, sometimes we look at to the fact that um, believers are, are just a help, just a help, as if, it's a, as if it's a consolation prize. It's kind of at the bottom of the list. Brethren, I, I don't believe that. I believe that a person who has the gift of being a help is, is vital. He, he, they might not be a platform speaker. She might not be, a, she might be a very quiet believer. But when an individual has the spiritual ability to be a help, it's vital. And it has tremendous value both in time. And of course, it has value for all eternity. More that could be said, but just, just look in the, in the same chapter, Romans chapter 16, and look at verse number 10. And Paul says, salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Now, does anybody know who Apelles is? <laughs> 
uh, I, I'm certainly open for help on this one because that, as far as I know, was the only mention of, of this individual in the, in the scriptures in the New Testament of Pelles. But what marked this believer was the fact that this believer was known as the approved, approved in Christ. Now, I would suggest that when it came to this description, Saluta Pelles approved in Christ, it could well have been that here was a believer that had gone through some very, very marked trials. He'd been tested, he had been tried, and he was now approved. He had come through the test. We're not told how long the test was. We're not told how, what kind of a trial it was. It may have been a long, lingering test. And yet he had proved consistently that his conduct was approved by the Lord, and he had passed the test with flying colors. You know, I think that as we look at so many believers, that they are experiencing a, a large variety of, of, of trials today. Yes, there are health trials, there are family trials, there are financial difficulties, there are assembly difficulties. Sometimes assemblies, believers in small assemblies, uh, just struggle just to keep the doors open, to keep the lights on. Sometimes there's very little gift. And sometimes there's very sparse blessing. And it's a, it's a chore to just keep going. Sometimes there's opposition from without. And sadly, sometimes there's criticism from within. And yet, here's a believer. And it just says he was approved, approved in the Lord. You know, it's a, it's a very, very heartwarming thing when you see a believer that's gone through some very great trials, great difficulties, and they're going on for God. Sometimes I've watched sisters come into a, a morning meeting, and I know where they're coming from. I'm well aware of what they have left at home, sometimes an unsaved husband, sometimes very, very difficult circumstances, and yet they have come in, quietly taken their place. I just couldn't help but think of Saluta Pelles, approved in Christ, approved in the Lord. Maybe I'm speaking to someone here, and you're in the midst of a trial. Maybe there's very few answers. Maybe it just seems like this trial is going to continue on forever. Um, we understand that our Lord controls the, the length of the furrow and the depth of the plow. He will not allow us to be tested above what we are able. But he desires that our confidence might be in him. That our eye might be focused on him. That we might take our spiritual strength from the scriptures that we might lean heavily upon fellow believers, that we might be able to work through the, through the trials of life. And even when there seem to be so few answers, we understand that underneath are the everlasting arms. And God has purposes known only to himself sometimes. We will understand it by and by, but right now the way is very difficult. But just remember Pele's approved in Christ. Let's just go very quickly over to Colossians chapter 1. Time is almost gone, Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> and just for the reference, verse number 7. It says, as you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. I'll just go to chapter 4, because there's more about this man. Verse number 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are at Laodicea and them in Herapolis, and so on. So here's Epaphras. What kind of a title could we put with regard to Epaphras? Well, I think that if we were to have listened to Epaphras, we might say, well, he's a, he's a preacher. He declares the word of God. But as Paul thought about this man, he knew him as the pleader, the pleader, the prayer laborer. And you know, that's, 
that's a vital part of every assembly, isn't it? And I think that we all appreciate, at least I appreciate the fact that, that prayer is difficult. Prayer, prayer is tough work because you can't pray carnally, can you? Well, you can try, but it doesn't, doesn't work very, doesn't accomplish very much. You can say words, but to actually make contact with heaven and to keep everything else to one side and to seek the Lord's face on behalf of your own needs and on behalf of a testimony, on behalf of fellow believers. Sometimes it's very, very difficult. But it's interesting that here's a man, and uh, he, was, he was writing from Rome because, or at least Paul was writing from, from Rome to Colossae, the assembly of Colossae, and Epaphras was a fellow prisoner. And yet Paul knew him as a man who labored fervently in prayers for the, for the believers there in Colossae and Laodicea and, and so on. You know, his, his very name means lovely, lovely, and I, I think that's great, isn't it? Epaphras, a lovely believer who is a pleader, who is a, a prayer warrior. He labored fervently for others in prayer. I've already mentioned that this is a work. This is a striving. And um, it's wonderful when an assembly has some prayer warriors. Most of them are quiet individuals, unassuming. You'd, you'd hardly hardly hear them maybe raise their voice, but in the quietness of their own homes, maybe in their bedrooms or maybe out in the field or whatever, they are praying earnestly for the blessing of God to mark the work of God and to mark the believers. You know, what strikes me about Epaphras is that his, his prayers were really selfless. He could have requested prayer for himself. He says, hey, look, I, I'm in prison. Please remember me because um, this is not an easy place to be. But there's none of that, is there? No, he's praying for others. His prayers were, were selfless, and he was praying for, for the, the spiritual blessings of fellow believers that they might stand. He wants their stability. They might stand perfect. That's the idea of maturity, complete in all the will of God. He wants them to move ahead with absolute certainty. And you'll notice that his prayers were, were ongoing. He was laboring always in prayer. I think sometimes our, our prayer life is hit and miss. Sometimes we're, we're deeply devoted to prayer, and then some, somehow we, we, we just lose contact. And um, sometimes you go days without really effective praying. I well remember a series that, actually my first series in, in Hartford, Connecticut, back in 1995, but what strikes me about uh, that series of meetings was not just the individuals that came and the blessing of God and salvation, we're thankful for that. But what I remember about that series of meetings involved one man, Matt Brescia, known to most of you believers, who, uh, who was spending his lunch hours at the hall to pray for the meetings. And he came up to Brother David Oliver and myself, and he says, brother, and he said, um, I'm praying at the hall. He says, if you want to join me, um, I'll be there at, from 12 to 1. You know, I, I remember going to those prayer meetings. And what still stands out in my mind, in my memory, was the reality of listening to a man speaking to his Father in heaven. No pretense. He wasn't saying prayers. He was pouring out his heart to his father in heaven on behalf of some of his loved ones, uh, a grand, some of his grandchildren and so on, and the, the blessing for the assembly. And I just thought, this is holy ground. Here's a man who's laboring fervently in prayers. And I've never forgotten the example that dear Matt said. Wonderful to have some prayer warriors in the assembly. And when I think of Moses uh, on, the, on the mountainside, looking down to the valley where Joshua was fighting, as long as his arms were up, Israel was, was winning. When his hands went down, Israel began to lose until finally Aaron and Hur took both of those hands and held them up that the victory 
might be accomplished. I think that's exactly our need today. That we cannot move ahead without contact with heaven, without fervent, effectual prayer to our God. And so I trust that we might be known as Epaphras, the pleader. Just drop down to verse number 17. And I think I'll close with this because the time is almost gone. Colossians chapter 4, verse number 17. And uh, Paul just says these simple words, and say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Now, I don't want to be hard on Archippus, but to me, this is like a, a PS to the Colossian letter. Uh, he signed off, and then he says, now, PS, and say to Archippus, Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Now, I have to confess that I, I'm really not totally sure whether Paul was exhorting or Paul was encouraging, or Paul was maybe just a very subtle rebuke. So let me just say this, and I, again, I'll have to talk to Archippus when I get home to heaven. But uh, I, I've wondered, was Archippus maybe known as an underachiever, an underachiever? Would he be known as the smoking flax? Uh, something was, was, was evident, something was happening, but it was very muted. It really wasn't very effective. And so here's Paul, and he just says, and say to Archippus. Now, Paul wasn't expecting Archippus to be in, in attendance when the letter was read. And uh, so he just said, now make sure that he gets this message. Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry, which you've received in the Lord, that you fulfill it. Now, he had, been, he had labored faithfully in the past. He was known as a fellow soldier in verse 2 of the little letter to Philemon. And it's interesting and it's obvious that, uh, that uh, Archippus had a, a specific work to do. He knew it, and it seemed that the believers knew it. But somehow Paul was just perhaps encouraging, perhaps prodding, or perhaps just kind of a, a subtle prod to this man to get with it, to keep going, to fulfill the ministry that he had received in the, in the Lord. Maybe his zeal had, had abated. Maybe it started well, but somehow he had, he'd gotten tired of it. You know, I think that sometimes a lot of us are like Archippus. Maybe we're underachievers. Sometimes we believers get tired of working in an assembly where there is very little appreciation. And that's a sad feature sometimes. We take some of our fellow believers for, for, for really for granted. They've always done it, and um, we just expect them to do it, and we never encourage them. We, we never help them. We just kind of expect them to go on, and sometimes, sometimes believers get tired of just, just moving on or just working in an assembly where there's very little appreciation. Sometimes believers allow the world with all the world brings into view to sap their energy. And even though they've started well, suddenly there's other, other areas to, to, uh, to run after, to invest in. And sometimes spiritual things begin to take second place. Sometimes believers, they, they get offended when others don't help. Why do I have to do it? Why doesn't somebody else help? And so sometimes we allow the ministry that we've received just to go by the by, go by the way. Sometimes believers become bitter, sadly, because of misunderstanding and because of some wrong looks. Sometimes, yes, believers are overwhelmed with, with personal problems, uh, personal cares, and even though we want, to, we want to invest in the things of God, suddenly, somehow, we, we just don't have the energy. And you know, when, when a servant underperforms, Everybody loses. Everybody loses. The assembly, the family, the servant himself, and yes, the Lord himself. Yeah. Archippus, get with it. Fulfill the ministry that you've received. 
And I think the same is true. You could almost find the same truth with regard to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Timothy, stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting out of my hands. Timothy was seemingly timid. Maybe he was overwhelmed by, by, by what was happening in the work. And uh, so Paul, again, is seeking to encourage him and to, and to stir him up just to get with it and to uh, rekindle the gift of God that had, was in him by the putting on of his hands. Of course, there's a lot to discourage, isn't there? And I trust that as we, as we would seek to move on for God, that we might keep our eyes on the Lord and that we might get our strength from the scriptures and that we might understand that we are serving the Lord Christ and that there is a day coming of revelation and reunion. Just mention this because time is gone. Philippians chapter 4 brings before us two, two sisters, Euodius and Syntyche. And sometimes I think these sisters have been given some bad press. Um, but there was a difficulty because Paul encourages them to be of the same mind in the Lord. Now, they had labored with Paul. And it's interesting that uh, as Paul writes to the recipient of the letter, he says, now, he said, I want you to help these women. It says those women, but these women. And so I have, I have wondered whether he's not referring back to Euodice and Syntyche. Help these women who have labored with me in the gospel. Thank God for our sisters. Sisters have a great work to do. And yes, we're well aware that it's not platform work, but I trust that we'll understand that the, the role of sisters is more than just baking cookies and uh, being hospitable hosts, hostesses. Sisters have a great work to do. And I think as you look at the scripture, you'll understand that one of the greatest examples of worship is found in John chapter 12 with Mary. Mary. And thank God for our sisters and, and the worship that they bring to the to the, the Lord's Supper. Many times the the level of worship is raised, I, I, I feel, not by the brethren, but by our sisters. There are personal soul winners. Sisters, uh, my, my own example, or my, my own experience, um, sister by the name of Blanche Box, maybe known to some personally, was a, was a very, very effective soul winner. Her eyes were always looking for someone that she could speak to about the Lord. And one day she spoke to me and she was a tremendous help in, in, in focusing for me my need and directing me to the Lord. And I thank God for the, the soul winning ability and the soul winning work of my mother in the faith, Blanche Box. There are still soul winners among our sisters. There are witness bearers. There are disciple makers. Yes, they're, they're involved in the ministry of sustaining and, and of building the, the saints of God. And I, I can't help but think of, 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 um, of Dorcas, that wonderful disciple there in, in the book of the Acts, who'd passed away. And as Peter came into that room, all the widows were, were standing there with, with the garment that, garments that Dorcas had made for them. Must have been an amazing sight. As they said, Peter, this is what she made for me last week. Peter, this is what she passed on to me, made by her own hands. And you know, there's, there's many sisters. And they are, they are the sustainers of so many of the, the needs of, uh, of, the, of the work of God. Aquila and Priscilla, they were teachers of the, of the word of God. It wasn't just Aquila, it was, it was Priscilla as well. And so we thank God for our sisters. And I trust that we might, we might appreciate that these are just a few of the, of the vast number of, of believers in, in the New Testament. And yes, in 2021, that are part of the work of God that impact our lives. And we are impacting other lives. I trust that we might be an encouragement and a prod to fellow believers until traveling days are done. Thanks again for the privilege of being together. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, we're thankful for the many, many believers that are noted in the scriptures, those whom thou hast saved and thou hast given a work. We're thankful, Father, for what they have meant to the work of God in their day.
We're thankful, Father, for the many believers that are even a part of the Zoom tonight and so many others that are laboring in their own sphere. We're thankful for them, Lord. Thank you for what they have meant to us personally. And thank you for what they have meant to the, to the work of God. Most of all, we give thanks for our, our Lord Jesus Christ tonight. He came as Jehovah's servant. He was abused and mocked and taunted and crucified. And yet he could say, I finished the work that thou gavest me to do. And there upon Calvary's cross, our father, he, he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. A greater price could not be paid. And father, we're thankful tonight for the, the great prospect that he that shall come will come and will not tarry. We're anticipating that moment. A day of reunion, a day of resemblance, a day of rejoicing. And Lord, we just commend our brother and sisters to thee. We think of the gospel, Lord, that's going forth in, in, in the open air and the drive-in meetings there in Summerside. We thank thee for our brethren and the assembly there that is laboring in this way. And we just pray that this summer season will be a time of sowing and a time of reaping, a time when the name of our Lord Jesus Christ will be exalted and honored and when souls will be awakened and reached and saved. And so we ask thy blessing, commending ourselves to thee and giving thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.